ladies and gentlemen, on tonight's episode of the Air Raid Hour, we are here to talk the Naheem Hines injury and the ramifications of that injury for the Buffalo Bills, their offense, and their special teams this year. We're going to talk about the signings of Darrington Evans and Jay Sternberger, and we're going to talk about all of the various different training camp storylines. But first, a little bit of mood, mood music. Hour, a Cover One Network podcast. Here are your hosts, Judge Mathis and Tilt Money. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the Air Raid Hour. A ton to talk about tonight. So Dave, let's jump right into it. And we're going to start our show off today with the injury to Naheem Hines, then we're going to get to the various other topics that we have to talk about today. But first thing this morning, there's always news on Monday when there's an episode of the Air Raid Hour. Today, the news, not so pleasant. Naheem Hines injured in a jet skiing accident by all accounts. Really not his fault. He was kind of just sitting there on his own jet ski and somebody ran into him. But it's a knee injury. It's a season-ending knee injury. The Buffalo Bills signed Darrington Evans. What are your thoughts on these, this injury to Naheem Hines and its effect on the Bills' special teams and the effect on the Bills' offense? Yeah, I mean, it is a blow to the return game, obviously, first and foremost, I think. And not that there aren't other guys capable, and we're going to get to that in a second. But Naheem Hines, after the Bills made that trade for him last year, obviously brought some stability to that return game where there had been a lot of question marks, really, even going back to when Andre Roberts left the team, right? Like since Andre Roberts left this team, the bills have really been trying to figure out who that return man is going to be in both the punt and kick return game. And like they've experimented with different things. We've seen even James cook back there at times in the preseason. We've seen Micah Hyde back there fielding punts. Isaiah McKenzie has obviously had his shot. There was a time where there were the market Marcus Stevenson stands wanted him to get his <laughs> shot. So the bills have had kind of like a, you know, a revolving door, if you will, at that, at that spot. So Heinz bringing that, that stabilizing courtside or presence there. And obviously the new England game last year, kind of the exclamation point to that with those two kick returns, but um, it's a blow in, in that regard. Now, how the new rules might be changed, how teams field kickoffs and, and, and handle kickoffs, you know, that's, that's probably another discussion. It is a blow. Um, I will say from my perspective, not as much of a blow to just the pure offense because we didn't really know exactly how Ken Dorsey planned to utilize Naheem Hines. So the unknown maybe of that, you can look at it one of two ways. Is Ken Dorsey going to add some wrinkles for Naheem Hines? We know he's an excellent receiver. Did that all the way back to his days at NC State He and with the Colts obviously early in his career. Maybe there were some plans to get him more involved. We'll never know now at this point for at least 2023. So... The focus to me turns now on the return game. Who's that going to be? Deontay Hardy. Um, are others going to be in the mix? Khalil Shakir. Like we'll we'll see. But obviously, you feel bad for Naheem Hines, the person as well. Um, kind of at the mercy of a freak accident there, and mm -hmm. nothing that he really did wrong. It sounds like so. Um, that is really unfortunate. And as RJ says here, Hines' news is tough. Freak accident at his age. If he doesn't come back well. It may be career ending, and let's hope that is not the case. So um, we'll just hope and, and pray now that he has a successful surgery or whatever that comes his way and that he recovers um, fully. Mm -hmm. We have uh, just Tippecanoe coming in saying losing Hines now. There's a lot of unknown, really, where we are all wondering what his role was going to even be in this offense anyway. And to me, you can sit here and you can prognosticate like, oh, I think Naheem Hines is going to be a big part of the offense this year. Oh, I think Naheem Hines is going to be this or this. We, In all honesty, we don't know what Naheem Hines' role was going to be. But what we do know is that now the Buffalo Bills have one less option and they have one mm. less option in a lot of different places. When you look at special teams, 
Naheem Hines was going to be your security blanket, the guy you knew who could kick return kicks. He could return punts. He showed it, and he, he was a stabilizing force last season for the Buffalo Bills at that position. Do we still have Deontay Hardy and Khalil Shakir? Of course we do. Maybe even Darrington Evans throws his hat in the ring. He just signed today in the return game. But you do have one less option, and there you lose your security blanket in Naheem Hines. Deontay Hardy has seven career fumbles on special teams, even though he was an all pro in 2019, I believe as a return specialist. Then you look at running back. We have now lost James Cook's handcuff. Yes, we have Damian Harris. Yes, we have Latavius Murray, but those are different style of running backs to James Cook and to Naheem Hines. So now on first down and second down, if James Cook gets hurt or James Cook struggles, you don't have Naheem Hines to fall on or utilize as an option. When you think about the passing game, who's going to be the gadget guy? Who's going to be this year's Isaiah McKenzie? Is it going to be Deontay Hardy? Well, Naheem Hines was another option there. So whether it's guys getting hurt, your your, your depth it now takes a hit with Naheem Hines gone, whether guys struggle, that takes um, – uh, you, you don't have someone there on the bench anymore if Naheem Hines is gone. So the Buffalo Bills losing out on a number of options here with the injury to Naheem Hines. They still have a very, very good roster, but now they don't have as much to fall back on, especially at some of those three positions that I just mentioned. Yeah, and I think that kind of really highlights maybe part of the reason why the Bills went with Darren and Evans as a signing today, given his experience in return in the return game. Um, it is one less option, and that's unfortunate to have an injury like that. That look, it 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 sounds bad, but like it's unfortunate to have an injury like that that doesn't happen on the football field, right? Like at least <laughs> if something happens like that on the field, you can say okay it's football. It's sort of part of the numbers game. Like it's, it's a violent game. Guys are ultimately going to get injured. It's a huge part of the week to week game, in the NFL injuries, but to have it happen like this probably leaves a lot, a lot of bills fans just saying, are you kidding me right now with this situation? <laughs> and so um, that's the thing that I think really probably just eats at people a little bit more. Um, and, and, a couple people in the comment section have been asking, and I, I totally forgot. I've been I've been traveling all day. I literally just got home 15 minutes ago. I spent 10 hours in the airport today coming back to the West Coast studio here from Buffalo. We'll be announcing the winner of our training camp tickets at the end of the show, and there's about 30 people or so in the running because you guys hit us up in the comment section this week. So with the Naheem, Naheem Hines news out of the way, we're going to touch on Darrington Evans tonight. We're going to touch on Jay Sternberger tonight. Both guys signed with the Buffalo Bills, but we'll touch on them as we talk about their positions because the main focus of tonight is going to be the storylines in training camp for the Buffalo Bills offense. And now Darrington Evans is a part of that storyline. Jay Sternberger mm -hmm. is a part of those storylines. So we'll get to those guys as we get to their position groups. But I want to start a conversation. I didn't even put quarterback here, right? Like all the other, the bottom ticker, all the other, it's running backs, it's wide receivers, it's tight ends. No. I put Allen and Dorsey as our first sort of topic here this evening, and that is because there really is only one quarterback in Buffalo, and that quarterback is Josh Allen. There's really no controversy, and this is going to be one of the number one training camp storylines. First off, his health. How is Josh Allen progressing, coming back from that elbow injury? What kind of throws can he make? Can he make all the throws now? He was just on a podcast uh, busting with the boys talking about how he really hasn't done all that much training this off season. It's sort of just, that's how he operates. He sort of likes to step away from the game. He comes back, he gets right back into it. And that's just sort of how he rolls. So taking a look at how quickly it takes Josh Allen to reacclimate how that elbow looks and how is Ken Dorsey taking the pressure off of Josh Allen, all of these new weapons that they have, are we going to see new and different personnel groupings? Those are the things to keep an eye out for as training camp progresses. What are your thoughts, Dave, about Allen and about Ken Dorsey and that relationship that we're going to see play out into year two here in training camp? Yeah, I mean, just personally, right? Like my view on how Josh and Josh Allen approaches the off season in my personal view is healthy, right? I mean, I think that everyone needs a break, right? Like, 
even the air raid hour, we took a, we took a couple week break <laughs> here in the summer, right? Like you need yeah. a you need to step away sometimes and just like do some things for yourself. You know, obviously he was like uh, a big personality at the American Century, the golf thing, and, and we saw other players there, athletes there as well, Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kel like so. Look, it's not a problem until it be until for some reason someone mm -hmm. can tie it to some poor play. Like y you just can't, right? There's no doubt in my mind that this guy's going to be ready to go. I've never questioned his motivation. I don't think 99% of Bills fans have qu ever questioned his motivation. If you want him to be a robot in the off season, like that's fine. But like, that's just not his style. And like his style is everything about him, right? It's how he approaches the off season. It's how he is in games. It's how he puts the team on his back. It all is what is, Josh Allen and RJ says, I think Allen has to do that. It's such a beating. It's not like Mahomes where he never gets touched. Well, a yeah, little, little dig at Mahomes there, but yeah, I kind of agree. And again, it's never been an issue. I think the bigger thing here is, and more of the pressure is going to be on Ken Dorsey, right? Because there was pressure on Ken Dorsey last year as a first year coordinator. I mentioned this in the, pre-training camp shows last year like we weren't really talking enough about how much pressure was on Ken Dorsey because we all figured that it was going to be like okay I'm taking some of the mantle from Brian Dable mixing a few of my own things I have Josh Allen everything's gonna be fine but we saw the concepts last year were a little clunky right and they weren't exactly schematically giving Josh Allen layups all the time we saw him improve over the course of the season but I really hope that you see that year one to year two jump from a coordinator's perspective with Ken Dorsey this year. So for, in my mind, the pressure of this duo is more so and and by a large margin on Ken Dorsey than it is Josh Allen. And early in camp, it'll be interesting to see if we actually throw in a few wrinkles and throw in a few things that we haven't seen before. Um, with that said, I think the relationship between the two of them seems fine, right? And it always seemed... Mm -hmm. Like you're going to have that they're both intense. Um, you know, Dorsey is a really intense guy as we know, but Josh Allen's pretty intense too and competitive. So again, from this duo, for me, the pressure is on Ken Dorsey squarely, um, in 2023. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent because like last year, sort of, there was that built in excuse towards the back half of last year. Josh Allen had that elbow injury. He really couldn't throw the ball in the intermediate Maybe the Buffalo Bills didn't have the dogs to sort of, you know, bully you in the run game and like a traditional run game. So really it was, hey, Josh, step back and make a play down the field wherever your arm feels comfortable throwing the football. And that really started to sort of deteriorate the flow of the offense as the season progressed further, the further and further we got along from that, that Josh Allen industry injury last year. And it sort of culminated in the Bengals game. So this year he comes into camp and there really are no excuses for Ken Dorsey. I remember last year, the LA Rams game, right? What was one of the number one things that we were talking about? We were talking about how Stefan Diggs was being used in the short passing game as an extension of the running game. And that mm -hmm. went away as the season progressed. We didn't see like Stefan Diggs added like 10, 15 pounds of muscle. And he was like stiff arming dudes in that Rams game. And then we really didn't see much of it after that Josh Allen industry injury. So again, using Stefan Diggs as an extension of the running game, getting other wide receivers like Deontay Hardy involved as extensions of the running game, implementing Dalton Kincaid, implementing, do we see more Quentin Morris? Do we see a lot of Reggie Gilliam on the field? Those two new running backs, Latavius Murray, Damian Harris, behind a new offensive line that could have Osiris Torrance to go along with Connor McGovern. So a lot of different things to keep an eye out for, and it's going to be really, really interesting to see how all of that sort of culminates. The one, the one thing outside of Josh Allen I think that we could maybe possibly see at quarterback is just keep an eye on Josh Allen, or not Josh Allen, keep an eye on Kyle Allen and how Kyle Allen flows, right? Because I like Kyle Allen. Kyle Allen's had some good games in the National Football League. He's got a good athletic profile. However, if you really look at it, Kyle Allen is the, has the least pedigree of any backup quarterback we've had in some time. Mitch Trubisky, Case Keenum, they all had decent pedigree. 
Could Matt Barkley push Kyle Allen for quarterback two if Kyle Allen doesn't come out and perform? And in that scenario, does Matt Barkley make the 43 and do the Buffalo Bills maybe go out and try to snag a guy to put on the practice squad? So again, it's not like anything I'm going to be remotely keeping my eye out for, but it could be something interesting to keep an eye out for as training camp progresses that, that, that maybe maybe there is a little controversy between Barkley and uh, Kyle Allen. I'll squash that controversy. I don't think there's going to be one. <laughs> I think it's, I think Kyle Allen's like the clear number two right now. I think it would have to be pretty catastrophic for him to, to lose that. Now I know coming into last season, Case Keenum certainly coming off, you know, playing a lot of games, starting games um, the year prior, like it, 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 that was maybe more of a clear cut situation, but I do think Kyle Allen obviously played games last year. Um, physically, ahead I think of Matt Barkley just from a stature arm talent like he's just I think a fresher younger player even if he's not super talented and like not that great like let's be real if we're having the discussion of one of these guys coming in it's really not good for news mm. for the season if that's the case anyway but I don't I don't know I would be surprised Pops Mafia comes in and says aren't three quarterbacks dressing this year only if those three quarterbacks are on your active 53 man roster so the Buffalo Bills would have to roster three quarterbacks on their 53-man in order to dress the emergency quarterback. If your third quarterback is on the practice squad, he is not eligible to dress, and he is not eligible to play on game day if the first two quarterbacks get hurt. So maybe this new rule changes the Buffalo Bills' minds, You know, especially with Josh Allen hurt last year. Maybe that gives a little bit of a scare to the Buffalo Bills, and they roster three quarterbacks. But I really, really doubt that the Buffalo Bills roster three quarterbacks this season. I think you'll see it'll most likely wind up being Matt Barkley on the practice squad. Jason M comes in and says, our backup QBs are just there to make sure Josh has a good time. If Josh goes down for more than one or two games, I think we have to give each other bro hugs and cry. Our backup QBs are there. So Josh is happy. And I, to an extent, right? Like Mitch and Josh didn't really know each other, but they developed a pretty good friendship over the course of, of the season that Mitch was here. Case Keenum didn't really know Josh Allen, but it seems like they developed a pretty decent friendship over the course of the year was here. And those were just pretty much the best of the bunch. The Buffalo Bills went out and got a veteran guy who maybe could win you two games in four starts if he had to. I don't know if you have that in Kyle Allen. So you're kind of you're kind of right here, Jason. And Kyle Allen is just a guy who technically lives with Josh Allen every summer. They work out together with Jordan Palmer every summer. They're, they're buddies. They're bros. Matt Barkley has a great relationship with Josh Allen, which helps him um, uh, you know, on the sideline. He helps him on the sideline on game days. I remember when Josh Allen was a rookie, Matt Barkley was you know teaching him how to be a better anticipatory passer because that is something Matt Barkley excels at because he doesn't exactly have the strongest arm. So all those quarterbacks play a role for sure. Uh, and this year, it does tend to lean more towards what Jason says than maybe uh, a quarterback that can that can go 500 in, in, in four starts. Um, on to the next topic here, we have running backs. And again, this is sort of an interesting topic now because the conversation sort of changes now with the Naheem Hines injury. Darrington Evans enters the fold. He's a guy who in the 2020 draft, you he was your boy like you you really wanted Darrington Evans in the third round you're like Darrington Evans in the third round Darrington Evans in the third round I think he went before the Buffalo Bills picked I forgot to look that up before the show started we ended up with Zach Moss who was my guy and I ended up being wrong still on a Zach Moss jersey though so uh <laughs> who won who won that, that, that that's, that's that, well you won because you got that Utah polo as well <laughs> out of it so I think you um won, uh, yeah but uh it, it, it it's super interesting really to look at this running back room now and I think our focus over the course of training camp is going to be like, who's 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 out there when Josh is out there? Like, that's that's what we're going to be looking for. Who's the first team running back? Who's the second team running? And obviously the beat reporters can't really report those things. So we're going to be counting on guys like, uh, you know, Dean Kindig over the Bills, um, you know, the, the the Bills Mafia blog uh, and his his Astro notes. We're going to be counting on fans tweeting from the stands. Who's out there with Josh Allen? We're gonna be we're gonna be watching the videos that they post on BuffaloBills.com. That's that's your indicator of whether they're first team or not, is what they're out there with Josh Allen. So it's James Cook, it's Damian Harris, and it's Latavius Murray. And it's gonna be really interesting to see how 
those guys sort of by the end of training camp sort of you know flesh out as we get into preseason games and as we get into the regular season do we see one of those guys rise to the top do we see a rotation of guys do we see two of those three guys do we see each guy in certain situations um do they sort of niche each of these backs these are all the things that we're going to be looking for over the course of training camp and Thank you, Danny, the, the man, you coming in saying Darrington Evans was drafted seven picks after Zach Moss. Mm. And and here's the thing, right? I don't think it changes a whole lot when you think about the, quote, one-two punch, right? I think the one-two punch was always going to be James Cook and Damian Harris, and then it, the third running back was just presumed that it was going to be Naheem Hines with, with Latavius Murray maybe having an outside chance to be a fourth running back if the bills kept four running backs or just the fourth um, running back, maybe as a practice squad running back. But now it certainly opens the doors for Latavius Murray to make the team. And really what this does, I think is at least for now, potentially changes the style of what your RB three may be right. Instead of having that sort of like, two minute drill sort of receiving type back like a Naheem Hines, you now maybe have a Latavius Murray who instead of having that two minute drill receiving back type guy as your third back, it's more of a goal line bruising type guy and how much of that really kind of overlaps with what Damian Harris gives mm -hmm. you. The fact is, is that both guys and, and Murray has been obviously a focus of yours throughout free agency and, and Eric on the film is still a really efficient back, right? Wherever he goes, he fits in, He's always been able to carve out a role and he's always been able to be efficient with his touches. So there is a place for Latavius Murray to get meaningful touches for the bills. I think now this comes down to another question of like previously you had sort of Naheem Hines in that running back three role. And as your kick and punt returner, the question was whether a guy like, like Latavius Murray would make the team as a fourth running back. Now I think the question becomes can Darrington Evans be the guy that becomes your one of your kick and punt returners on the roster and force the bills to maybe keep mm -hmm. four running backs again. I don't know. I think that's going to be the big thing. If Darrington Evans, I think shows well enough in camp as someone the bills can count on in the return game, he could force the bills hands and have them keep those four running backs. And in, in which case I'll say, I like that mix if that's mm -hmm. the case, right? I you got the speed with Evans. Obviously, you you mentioned I was a big fan of his coming out of the draft. Played at App State. I know a lot of people. I live in North Carolina. I know a lot of people that went to App State are big Darrington Evans supporters. Um, they're the ones that kind of forced me to pay more attention to him coming out and watching him and his tape before he came out. I mean, he's he's electric in the open field, right? He's just never really had mm -hmm. that chance. Um, and obviously he's battled through some of his own injuries, but it makes things very interesting. It, it certainly is a blow to lose Naheem Hines, but I do think the signing of Darrington Evans maybe like softens it slightly. And if anything, maybe just gives Latavius Murray more of a chance to make this team. Yeah. Danny, the man, he comes in and says Blackshear, like who could be this year's Raheem Blackshear? Could you see Jordan Mims or could you see Darrington Evans? sort of make a move in training camp. None of the guys that the Buffalo Bills currently have on the roster preclude one of these guys from really stepping up their game and not making the roster. Because last year it was tough. It was really tough for Raheem Blackshear to make the roster because of the guys that we had. We had all that invested in Devin Singletary. We had all of that stuff we had invested in Zach Moss. The draft capital invested in James Cook. On top of that, we had... Taiwan Jones and we were invested in him because he was a special teams gunner. There really wasn't as well as Raheem Blackshear played. There really wasn't a chance for him to crack the 53 man roster. And then he ultimately ended up in Carolina taking off our practice squad when he got there after the initial uh, cut down. So this year, there's nothing standing in Jordan Mims way. There's nothing staring in Darrington Evans way. There is no Taiwan Jones because Trent, Trent Sherfield can um, you know, be a gunner because Justin Shorter can be a gunner. We can carry four running backs. Latavius Murray's contract isn't exactly read as a guy who's a roster lock. He probably is now because of the Naheem Hines injury, but he wasn't before. So none of these things really preclude Evans and Mims from 
making a move and becoming a part of this Buffalo Bills roster. But I am going to be looking at situations and I'm going to be looking at how these guys are utilized because I've been pretty vocal on social media. I want James Cook to be the dude between the 10 yard lines. I want him to be the first down and the second down back. I want him to be the guy who gets a bulk of the carries during the game. I would rather see Damian Harris and Latavius Murray relegated to short yarded situations and to be used inside the 10 yard line, right? Mm -hmm. Goal line situations, short yarded situations. I want everything else to be James Cook. However, James Cook needs to prove himself in pass protection, number one. James Cook needs to prove at his stature he can carry a load, number two. And number three, Ken Dorsey and Sean McDermott have to philosophically want to give him the ball that many times. So training camp is going to be a really good indicator. What situations is James, Cook's being, James Cook being used in? What situation is Damian Harris being used in? What situation is Latavius Murray being used in? Because I can honestly close my eyes and envision week one Damian Harris sliding into Devin Singletary's role and James Cook maybe having a slightly amplified version of his role last year. Maybe you get closer to like 50-50 as opposed to like the 60-40 that it was with Singletary and and Cook. So it's going to be really interesting to see how these running backs are all utilized and how Ken Dorsey decides to, to implement them in these training camp practices. Yeah, and that's the thing that, again, gets back to Ken Dorsey, right? Because you're talking mm-hmm. about you now have a mix of guys that have a bunch of different... It all comes back to Ken Dorsey tonight. <laughs> yeah, it all comes back to Ken Dorsey. I mean, look, uh, and, and we know one of the big things probably is going to be, as I think Claude asked, can Evans play special mm-hmm. teams? Is he a good send down blocker? One of these things is going to be uh, pass protection, right? Who's going to be the guy that can really be counted on for pass protection? That was one of the things that Devin Singletary really was an unsung hero. It was, was in his pass protection, was a top 10 um, pass protecting running back for PFF's grades last year. Uh, It's one of those things that probably didn't get talked about enough about Devin Singletary was his pass blocking uh, ability. And so Mm -hmm. that could be an interesting um, factor too into who maybe gets these um, third down duties or if James Cook maybe stays or doesn't stay on the field on third downs to your liking, right? Will he be able to hold up in pass protection? Mm -hmm. I think he can, right? But I think like when you have a guy like Latavius Murray, who's a Haas and you have a guy like Damian Harris, who's, who's very um, experienced in it as well. Like maybe the bills want to eliminate hits on James cook, eliminate contact on James cook where they can. And maybe he doesn't, play on every third down, although you have to kind of balance that with like wanting him in as a, in as a weapon on third mm-hmm. down. So that to me is going to be interesting. Who holds up in pass protection at the running back position could um, provide some clues as well. Dan, the man with a great comment here. He says, Marcus Murphy might still be available. I'll tell you what, if we could hop into a time machine and pull out like vintage Marcus Murphy from his days when he was in the Buffalo Bills. Preseason kind Marcus of, Murphy. Was preseason exciting. Marcus Murphy. That would be the guy that would be a legitimate, like could could give, you a, give a legitimate run for a roster spot to fill that void left by Naheem Hines. Marcus Murphy, I I always love those like running backs the Buffalo Bills just pick up off the street. Raheem Blackshear, Joyk Bell. Didn't Marcus uh, Murphy have like a, a punt return TD or kick return TD in the preseason or something? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Wonder what yeah. Christian Wade is up to. Do we have uh, Christian? Is Christian Wade available? Oh god, don't even start, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to the wide receivers now. And listen, when training camp starts, every single person on uh, in Bills Mafia on social media, every single beat reporter uh, on this show, even though I probably know how pointless it is. We're still going to everyone's going to be freaking out over one thing. What wide receivers are on the field when Josh Allen is on the field? Same thing we were talking about with running backs. When QB one is on the field, what wide receivers are on the field? Is it who who's seeing more snaps with Josh Allen? Is it Khalil Shakir or Deontay Hardy? Is it Trent Sherfield or is it? Deontay Hardy is it Justin Shorter or is it Tyrell Shavers it's who's seeing snaps with Josh Allen I think outside of the dig stuff which we can talk about in in a minute I think who's playing with Josh Allen who's playing with Kyle Allen is going to be the number one storyline because after Stefan Diggs and Gabriel Davis we really don't know how this wide receiver room is going to flush out the season 
We don't. And now the the Naheem's Naheem Hines injury may have a domino effect potentially on the wide receiver reps, right? It could be that I, I forgot who put it in the comment section, but I, I fully agree with the point they made. Could we have a situation where offensive reps are limited for whoever the Bills want to have as that return man, whether that's Khalil Shahir or Deontay Hardy? On one hand, you'd like to see what Deontay Hardy can do for you in this mm -hmm. offense as a downfield threat. He's really he's really the only guy outside of maybe Justin Shorter um, who is that type of player. And is he going to be a guy that splits between offense and special teams? We know the Bills haven't traditionally liked to do that a ton, right? They've traditionally liked to have their return men not play a ton on offense. When we saw Isaiah McKenzie kind of um, take a step back on offense when he became the return man. So that Khalil Shakir versus sort of Deontay Hardy slot battle, which we presume will be the slot battle to start mm -hmm. the year could be interesting. I will say this. I have a, it's maybe a gut feeling, but I have a sneaking suspicion. Trent Sherfield is going to, you know, not necessarily surprise, but I, I feel like we're going to hear his name mentioned as mm -hmm. being pretty solid on the offensive side of the ball as well. As much as we know, he's a great special teamer and he's really kind of down there near the bottom of the depth chart. I would not be surprised if you hear some fairly glowing reviews, I'll say for Trent Sherfield early in camp, because he's really probably an underrated receiver and that could be an interesting name to watch as well. I, I I've been a fan of Trent Sherfield since his time in Arizona and he's always come in in Arizona. He he's sort of like the Marcus easily, but like he's actually stayed healthy, right? Like he's always impressed you on special teams in Arizona and San Francisco in Miami, but he also makes some plays on offense. So if he gets um, a more increased role on offense, if he gets a quarterback like Josh Allen, which he's never really had before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be really interesting to see. I know I, it, he wasn't supposed to be the slot receiver for the Miami dolphins last year. He wasn't. But he earned those reps, and he got on the field because of injuries, because he outplayed other guys. And he ended up being their their dominant slot receiver last year when he was really only supposed to be a team's guy because he impressed those coaching staff, because he created a rapport with, with Tua and with uh, Teddy Bridgewater and all them. So you're right. I think that Trent Sherfield is a name that I think a lot of people are sleeping on. And that's sort of the other question that we're going to have to ask ourselves or we're going to be looking out for in training camp. And that is who plays where, right? Because we want a more versatile offense. I want to see Gabriel Davis in the slot. I want to see Stefan Diggs in the slot. I want to see versatile chess pieces and guys moving around and, and getting inside, getting outside. So it's going to be really interesting to see in training camp where guys line up at wide receiver because Trent Sherfield, traditionally a slot receiver, but he certainly has the prototype in the body to play on the boundary. You have Deontay Hardy, who you would assume is a slot receiver based on his size, but Brandon Bean has called him the four wide receiver, saying he has inside-outside versatility, and Deontay Hardy has performed on the outside in the National yeah. Football League despite his diminutive stature. Khalil Shakir is another guy where you'd assume he's a slot, but he can also play on the boundary as well. Then you have guys who traditionally would be boundary guys, guys like Justin Shorter, uh, guys like Desmond Patman, Keyshawn Johnson, Isaiah Coulter, Tyrell Shavers, etc. So it's going to be really interesting to see where all of these guys are lining up. Are they the X? Are they the Z? Or are they in the slot? And and to be perfectly frank, the top five wide receivers, the ones you just mentioned, all have inside outside flex, mm -hmm. right? Stefan Diggs can play inside out. Gabe Davis can. Justin um, Deontay Hardy can. Trent Sherfield can, right? Khalil Shakir can. Like, it's, we're pigeon, we're not pigeonholing these guys, but people sometimes pigeonhole like Hardy as a slot because of his size, but he has actually played more of his snaps on the outside than he has in the mm -hmm. slot. If you go look at his snap counts over his career, he's actually played more on the outside than he has in the slot. I like that makeup for the Bills where you actually have one through five, you can line these guys up wherever you really want if you're Ken Dorsey. And as the theme of the show kind of continues, it's up to Ken Dorsey to kind of figure out how to best use these guys. Now I do expect that the main packages, we will see Stefan Diggs and Gabriel Davis on the outside um, in most packages. Right. But that doesn't mean that you can't have some creative 
situations to scheme guys into certain areas of the field. Um, and we're, as we're about to talk about with Dalton Kincaid in the next segment, like there is a lot of opportunity to create layups for Josh Allen and make things a lot easier for him this year. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy every play, every game, but like there are ways you can give him, you know, a cheap four, five, six yards with some of these guys mixing and matching them around the field. So probably more so as we get into the next segment, but I like the fact that one through five here all technically yeah. could play inside and out. And, and, and that's what I want to see. Like I want to see versatile chess pieces. Cause I think that's going to be another th interesting thing. Obviously everyone in training camp is going to be keeping their eyes on Stefan Diggs. What's Stefan Diggs is body language. How do him and Josh Allen interact? Like that's going to dominate storylines. Is Stefan Diggs going to speak to the media at some point? That will dominate storylines. But what I'm going to be looking for is I'm going to be looking for Ken Dorsey. What are you doing to sort of uh, quell the fears or to quell the misgivings of Stefan Diggs? Are you moving him around? Are you using him in short situations, extensions of the running game like we talked about? How is Stefan Diggs being utilized? How are you getting the ball in his hands? How creative are you being with him? Because I think a lot of that needs to change. And I think Ken Dorsey needs to get more creative in the way he gets the ball into Stefan Diggs's hands this season. I mean, and that's the thing, right? It's like you look at his targets over the last couple of years and at the end of the season, the statistics look great, right? But you also need to realize that like a lot of those catches and, and targets in 2022 were, were difficult, right? They weren't easy catches. They weren't easy plays in a lot of situations, right? There wasn't a lot of situations where Stefan Diggs was catching the ball with a lot of open grass around him, right? It was a lot of, um, you know, catching, fighting through some, some traffic or catching and immediately going down to his credit. Like he's really great at protecting himself, but man, you would like to see a little bit more of, um, some space around these guys and giving Stefan Diggs a chance to really rack up some of that yak. And like, he's got that body type where he doesn't necessarily have to run past guys. He's got enough moves and enough in the package, like as a, like mm -hmm. almost as a running back with some of his stiff arms and things like that, that he can make some things happen. And, and as you've seen, right. And we saw it in the Rams game. You mentioned when he gets involved early, um, and he's intense and he lets that emotion kind of come out like that usually spells good things for the bills mm -hmm. um, in games when Stefan Diggs is in that type of situation. And so that's another thing I'd like to see is him getting fed early in games as well um, yeah. and getting him really into the game super early, making it a concerted effort to say, you're my guy. I'm going to get you the ball early and often giving mm -hmm. you like, like, I mean, Look at when DeAndre Hopkins came back from his suspension last year, how many targets per game that guy got. Like, I mean, they were just absolutely peppering. He was peppered. Yeah, he there was you peppered. go. <laughs> he was peppered. Like, pepper Stephon Diggs with 10 to 15 targets a game, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's what you need to do. So, Ken Dorsey's been, and really the Bills have been so fortunate that Diggs has been so efficient with his targets that they hadn't necessarily had to get 15 a game, 15 targets a game, mm -hmm. but I'd like to see him pushing in that 10 to 12 to 15 targets a game would be ideal for me. Walter S comes in with a great comment. He says in a perfect world, I'd love to have a wide receiver that could play outside more predominantly. So we can put Davis in the slot. His biggest plays have come from the middle of the field. I, I don't think people, I, I don't think, I, I, I guess some people do. And, and I might be overstating this, but I don't think people realize how big of a loss, Emmanuel Sanders was and that inside outside versatility, that boundary presence, because it allowed people like Gabriel Davis to work in the slot. Emmanuel Sanders was replaced by Gabriel Davis. So then there was no one really to take that pressure off of, of, of Gabriel Davis. They tried it in spurts with John Brown last year. So it'll be interesting to see if whether Trent Sherfield can come in and do it. Deontay Hardy can come in and do it. Who can come in, maybe play on the boundary a little bit, take the top off the defense and open things up over the middle of the football field for Gabriel Davis in the slots. That's a really interesting point from Walter uh, S there. Speaking of wide receivers, bottom half of the wide, the wide receiver depth chart, last topic here, Justin Shorter, fifth round pick. Khalil Shakir, fifth round pick. Now, a lot of people, like the hot take on, on social media was, Khalil Shakir's roster spot is not secure. And anyone who is saying that, I think 
that got squashed today when the Naheem Hines injury news came out because Khalil Shakir gives you that punt return ability. And if he's not the starter, he's your backup. So I think Khalil Shakir, Khalil Shakir has secured his roster spot. Obviously, he's got to go out there in training camp and continue to, continue to do what he does. So that really just leaves Justin Shorter, fifth round pick, special teams guy. Brandon Bean talked about when they drafted him. We drafted him because we feel like he can get a jersey early because of his ability to play special teams. Is there anyone who can crack the top six not named Gabriel Davis, Stefan Diggs, Trent Sherfield, Deontay Hardy, Khalil Shakir, or Justin Hor- Hardy, or excuse me, Justin Shorter? It's it's really hard to find a path for Isaiah Coulter, Desmond Patman, Keyshawn Johnson, Brian Thompson, Tyrell Shavers, Marcel Aitman, and Jalen Wayne. What do you think? Uh, I just don't think that, I mean, the odds are stacked against them, right? I think you see that the bills drafted Justin short in the fifth round, Brandon Bean makes those comments. I think he would really have to struggle in camp and, and really struggle mightily in the preseason for that to happen. I just don't see, I don't really see a path where the bills use a fifth round pick on a guy like that, where he does have that special teams ability and it just, it just falls flat. Right. He also brings a little bit of a downfield element too uh, on offense. And again, as your wide receiver six, like that's a guy that you're really not expecting to contribute much on offense. Like this is a guy that's maybe going to get five to 10 targets in the season. And people are going to maybe like scoff at that, but like, that's, that's what it's going to be for your wide receiver six. Like I don't expect um, a ton of targets for that position, but like you mentioned his ability to get a Jersey early because of other reasons. And in a pinch, if he needs to come in due to injuries or other things, I think he probably gives you maybe the best ability to come in and and contribute. Um, I do like Tyrell Shavers as a dark horse, right? I mean, we know about his special teams ability, but he seemed to me screams practice squad. Um, He's a guy you signed as a UDFA. Mm -hmm. Obviously the bills and a lot of teams were, were interested in signing him, the bills got him. And I just see the other guys right now is probably more practice squad type of guys. I mean, shorter playing in the sec, obviously having that experience at Florida and, and being the fifth round pick the, you know, the odds are in his favor that he's going to be the guy. And the bills do have an embarrassment of riches sort of on the back half of the depth chart, because a lot of these guys I think are going to be like preseason all-stars, right? Like, Desmond Patman is a guy who's produced in the preseason and in some regular season situations in this league. Same with Keyshawn Johnson, same with Marcel Aitman. So there's like a ton of dudes. Like it's like an XFL all-star team in the back half of the Buffalo (laughs) bills. Uh, Water steer death are just a lot of really interesting names. And I kind of feel bad for some of these guys because I feel like if they were on a different football team, they could be competing for a fifth or a sixth roster spot. It's just unfortunate that here in Buffalo, those, those spots are kind of taken up. It's almost that Raheem Blackshear situation last year where there just was no room for him all right so that leads us now to the tight end position which is what everyone wanted to talk about because as we were talking about wide receivers everyone was hitting up the comment section talking about don kincaid is the slot receiver this year and those are some of the things that i want to talk about the storylines for the tight ends heading into training camp how knox and kincaid play off of each other that's going to be something that everyone's going to keep an eye out for how is dalton kincaid used Is he on the field with Dawson Knox all the time? Is he getting reps with the first team offense over Dawson Knox? Is he in 12 traditional 12 personnel? Is he flexed out into the slot in what situations and what ways are we utilizing Dalton Kincaid? That's probably going to be one of the number one things that fans have their eyes out for at St. John Fisher college this year. Yeah, especially when it comes to red zone packages and packages near the goal line. I think that you start thinking about putting guys like Stefan Diggs, Dalton Kincaid in the slot, Gabe Davis, and then Dawson Knox on the field at the same time. We know about Kincaid's prowess um, in the red zone, his ability to go up in high point. I think it gives you more opportunity in the short areas of the field to take pressure off Josh Allen, right? And give him an option like, traditionally we've seen a guy like Cole Beasley or types like that work in the slot and be really um, pure route runners, but more of like kind of that low to the ground type of type of action. We haven't really seen the go up and get it type of action much 
out of the slot, right? It's been either like guys like Gabe Davis doing that at times and Dawson Knox, but now you add another guy to the mix like Dalton Kincaid down in the red area, down in the inside the 10. I feel like this really hopefully makes the bills a more efficient team at scoring touchdowns in the red zone. That's something that the bills have kind of ebbed and flowed with over the last couple of years, right? There've been times where they've been really good in the red zone, finishing drives and there were times where they, they really haven't. Right. And it's been one of the, I guess, critiques of this offense. That is a really, really good offense and trying to pick holes in it. And sometimes those holes have been found and some of those deficiencies have been found in the red area. And so I think that's where a guy like Dalton Kincaid can add efficiency to your offense, putting him in the slot, put even if he's not in the slot, putting him and mm -hmm. Knox both in line, giving the bills a little bit more um, meat in the middle of the field, but also not giving away what they're doing on offense. Like, okay, we've got two tight ends on the field, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're running the ball with guys like Dawson Knox and Dalton um, and, and Kincaid. Right. So again, I think it just opens up opportunities and now it becomes a matter of how creative can we get? And is mm -hmm. it going to be a situation where we're actually seeing creative schematics or are we going to be seeing like a lot of just, jump ball type of things. Mm -hmm. I want to know match, finding matchups. Yeah. Right. Mismatches. I, yeah. I, I, that's what I want to see what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So Claude says Kincaid's going to be a Jack of all trades type. He may even be the outside guy that allows Davis some inside work. He's definitely gonna be a red zone target. Yeah. And I think again, the bills drafted this guy in the first round, they traded up ahead of Dallas to get him. The expectation is that he plays a lot. I think, look, my, conservative projection were was 40 to 50 targets that may be underselling him as a, mm -hmm. as a guy that you drafted in the first round. I don't think 50 targets is anything to sneeze at. I think it's, I think it's a decent amount. Um, and I think that he'll be used in really important situations. And I think the impact of his targets and the impact of his catches and where, what he does to affect games is going to be more important than yeah. volume. Yeah, the, the, you you just said the keyword right there. The volume might not be there, but the impact certainly can, especially if he becomes a legit um, threat in the um, in the in in the red zone. We just we just spent a, a, like five minutes talking about Dalton Kincaid, and the comment section is Kincaid this, Kincaid that, Kincaid this, Kincaid that. And one of the things that I I don't want to forget this training camp, and one of the things that I'm going to be following along is. Dawson Knox is still here and it's not exactly like he's a tackle extended, right? Like he is still a legitimate receiving threat in the national football league. So I want to see how Ken Dorsey is utilizing Dawson Knox in the passing game. I want to see if he, how he's finding ways to get the ball into Dawson Knox's hand. And I want to make sure that Dawson Knox's presence doesn't get overshadowed by the, the influx of uh, a Dalton Kincaid. Yep, and just the tip of canoe said it perfectly. Said before, having all the toys is nice, but it comes down to how Dorsey puts it all together. Um, and again, look, we were talking about leading up to the draft. Oh, could the Bills get Jordan Addison? Could the Bills get Zay Flowers? And they went in different direction and went for the for the tight end, the weapon, right? And the more you kind of break it down, the more you think like this could be really beneficial to this offense. We heard from coaching you know, coaching staff of Dalton Kincaid's in college talking about how they used him like Travis Kelsey. They compared him like to Travis Kelsey. And obviously there is no one that is Travis Kelsey other than Kelsey himself. But the fact that the, the fact that he's even getting those types of comparisons, even as a player in college, it, it kind of tells you what the bills have at their feet in the guy like this with the potential that he has. And, if they can really squeeze out of Dalton Kincaid the best of what he has to offer and put him in the best position to make plays based on his style of play, they could really have something special mm -hmm. here. Now, like you said, we can't forget about Dawson Knox. The Bills are paying him big money. We know he got that big contract. They cannot forget about Dawson Knox, and they won't. And then my head kind of drifts to, okay, well, maybe this becomes an offense focused around Stefan Diggs, Gabe Davis, Dawson Knox, and Dalton Kincaid as kind of your two and two, your two receivers, your two tight ends. That could be really interesting to me. And that mm -hmm. I think could create mismatches against defenses, especially because that's not something that really a ton of teams in the NFL do right now, right? Is mm -hmm. is kind of 
We saw that for a bit. What teams can you say now really kind of have like a a dual headed monster at tight end that are that that mm-hmm. gets used? I can't really think of of many at all um, that do it now. I mean, you had the Aaron Hernandez and Gronk back in the day. You had like Gerald Everett and Tyler Higby for a stint there in, in L.A. But like, what else? Like, I, I'm not seeing it a ton across the NFL right now. RJ Melville coming in with a great comment. He says, I think you see more knocks in the Y and maybe a little bit more chipping at the line. Then Kincaid will just be the slot 90% of the time. And that's a good way to look at it as well. And, and just because Knox is chipping doesn't mean he can't be utilized in the passing game. We see, we saw, we see a ton and I'm not trying to make any comparisons between these two players at all, but how many times does Travis is Travis Kelsey wide open because Travis Kelsey starts to play chipping on somebody and then disengages from the block and goes out and catches a pass, right? So maybe you can get Dawson Knox involved in the offense, utilizing that strategy. Before we move on to offensive line, the Buffalo Bills made an addition to the tight end room today, and I'm really excited about this addition. They signed Jace Sternberger out of the USFL, played for the Birmingham Stallions, six foot four, 250 pounds, former wide receiver at Texas A&M, Transitioned to tight end towards the back half of his career there at College Station. He had 33 catches for 517 yards and seven touchdowns this year for the USFL champion Birmingham Stallions. 2019 pre-draft visit with the Buffalo Bills. He was also taken in the third round. He was a guy that I think Brandon Bean and company sort of grouped together with Dawson Knox the year they drafted Dawson Knox. They obviously went with Knox. Sternberger went to Green Bay. He didn't exactly pan out. He is now in the UFL. He had a pretty big season. I think he's a guy who could come in and he could legitimately give Quentin Morris a run for his money at TE3. And if you're a Buffalo Bills team and you're looking to run more 12 personnel this season, you're going to want to want more than two tight ends on your roster. We carried three last year. So is it going to be Quentin Morris again? Does Jay Sternberger give him a run for his money? Do Jay Sternberger and Quentin Morris make the team and the Buffalo Bills decide to move on from like a fullback and Reggie Gilliam? Or do they roster a whole bunch of tight ends and and stuff this year? So these are some of the things that we're going to be looking out for over the course of training camp. How does Quentin Morris look entering year three? How does Jay Sternberger look coming in from the USFL? And how is Reggie Gilliam being utilized? So all of these other pieces are at play while all the focus and attention is on the first round pick behind, sort of behind in, in the second and third team units. Right. And the knock on Sternberger coming out was that he wasn't a great blocker and you need to mm-hmm. work on that aspect of his game, but was a good route runner and, and had pretty good hands. And as Pete says, Jace was a great, great college prospect. You think about what that meant for the bills when they drafted Dawson Knox. I mean, I, I think Knox, even with the less experience, the bills liked his upside probably more. Um, but now they comes full circle and Sternberger's in the mix. I think that, the competition probably for a roster spot will be between him and Quentin Morris. I I can envision a scenario right now where the Bills would keep a stern burner, let's say, over a Reggie Gilliam. But, I mean, things could evolve over the course of training camp. Like, right now, I would say that Morris and stern burner will be battling for T, like TE3, and that would probably be all the Bills keep would be three. But again, I could be wrong and they could end up going a different direction, keeping four. They want to run more 12. Like maybe that's the, maybe that's the route they're going, but I think the battle in camp will be Quentin Morris versus Jay Sternbarner, both athletic, both um, obviously more known for their pass catching ability than blocking. So if that's the case, let's see how it shakes out and may the best man win. And if the bills only keep three tight ends, that competition is going to be fun to watch in camp. Yeah, I actually just went back and I'm looking at the uh, 2019 NFL draft. And this was, uh, there were three guys, three tight ends who all have become, who all visited the Buffalo Bills pre-draft. And all three of these guys eventually became Buffalo Bills. Obviously, Dawson Knox, who was drafted. Where was Dawson Knox drafted in that draft? I'm losing his name. Like 96th or 94th or something. He was was, uh, conditional. Devin Singletary was picked at pick 74. Pick 75 was Buffalo Bills pre-draft visit Jay Sternberger. Mm. So the Buffalo Bills might have taken Devin Singletary at 74 
saw Jay Sternberger go off the board at 75 and maybe got a little ticked off because who knows? Maybe Jay Sternberger was ahead of Dawson Knox. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Maybe, maybe Brandon Bean was like, well, there are three guys that I really like. Uh, and there's only one running back I really like, so I'm going to take the running back. But then the very next pick was Jay Sternberger. And then you scroll down a little bit here in the 2019 draft, pick 86. So 10 picks before Dawson Knox, former Buffalo Bill, Cahal Waring, who was also a pre draft <laughs> visitor, uh, went 86 to Houston. And then Dawson Knox went 96 to the Buffalo Bills. He was a uh, you know a, 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 a pick that we traded up with Washington. It was a compensatory pick. And we end up getting the best of the three tight ends there. So it all worked out in the end for the Buffalo Bills. But it's just funny that Waring, Sternberger, and Dawson Knox all made their way at one point to the Buffalo And we liked Bills them all roster. in yeah. the pre-draft process. It was like that, uh, it was like that time that the entire NC State defensive line, like John McCargo, Manny Lawson. Uh, Mario Williams, they all made their way to the the Buffalo Bills at one point. All right, on to the offensive uh, offensive line now. This is a, a, another thing where it gets really, really interesting, and who knows what to and what not to read into when it comes to the offensive line in, in, in training camp. Because like it, it, last year, especially with Aaron Cromer, I think we all need to remember – Aaron Cromer likes to mix things up. He likes to play guards at tackle. He likes to play tackles at guard. He likes to cross train guys. He like he thinks that offensive linemen are better when they know multiple positions. You're a better right guard if you've also played left guard and know exactly what the left guard's doing. You're a better right guard if you've also played some right tackle and know what the right tackle is going to be doing. Because when you see the right tackle make one move, you know what's going to happen, and you as a right guard can are, are better off because of it. So Aaron Cromer likes to move guys around. So it's going to be really interesting to sort of read into all of the movement that we see. But also I'm wondering if maybe we don't see a lot of movement this year, because I'd like to think Deion Dawkins is entrenched at left tackle. I'd like to think Connor McGovern is entrenched at, at, at left guard. I'd like to think that Mitch Morris is entrenched at center. And then I'd also like to think that right guard is a battle between Ryan Bates and Osiris Torrance exclusively. And I'd like to think that, Right tackle is a is a competition between Spencer Brown and and Brandon Shell exclusively. So it'll be really interesting to see. Like, there's really not a lot of move move movement that can be had there. So let's start with the right guard competition. What are you keeping your eye out for there? Well, I think one thing I'm going to be looking for is like, is Ryan Bates going to start? Is he going to start camp as the starting right guard in? The Bills draft, drafted of Cyrus Torrance looked by all accounts to be possibly the best guard in the draft, right? Um, you know, a lot of people had him as the top guard in the draft. How quickly will the Bills give a guy like Osiris Torrance a crack at first team reps, like if at mm -hmm. all, right, early in camp? So that to me is going to be super interesting. I think for if I'm like hoping for an outcome, I'm hoping that eventually Osiris Torrance kind of pushes uh, you know, Ryan Bates out of that spot and Ryan Bates kind of becomes that sort of swing interior offensive lineman at a decent contract. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're paying him, you know, you, you're paying him a decent amount, but as a backup center and backup left guard, backup right guard, it's not the worst position to be in. Now, I think what's going to be interesting to me is come that first preseason game, who gets the first shot at sort of right guard right in that preseason game. And that might give us a, a, an idea of sort of where the bills or heads are at after the first several practices. So um, my heart really wants Osiris Torrance to start camp at right guard, but at, with the first team, but I feel like it's not going to be until maybe a couple weeks in or, or maybe net after the first preseason game. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm excited for that one. I'm just hoping, and again, I know the beat reporters can't can't really report these things. That's why you, you got to follow along on social media, on Twitter. The Cover One guys will be there for the the first week of camp or so, and you know, in and out. They, I, we both have some serious FOMO not being able to make it there to training camp again this year and, and hang out with the guys. But man, how pumped would you be if first day Wednesday morning, first team offensive line left to right, Deion Dawkins, Connor McGovern, Mitch Morse. Osiris Torrance and Spencer Brown. Like if he just came out in day one was the right guard, I, I would be really, really happy to see that. 
and we've lost Dave here. So hopefully we get Dave back and I don't have to go solo for too much this evening. But as we move along here on the offensive line, another competition that I'm going to have my eye out for is right tackle. And let me know in the comments section what you guys think since uh, we lost out on Dave here. And I'll read some of your comments, but I'm not buying the I'm not buying a right tackle competition. I, I don't think that there's a competition at right tackle. I think the, the 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 job at right tackle is Spencer Browns, and it's Spencer Browns to lose. Now we could get a week into training camp, we could get two weeks into training camp, and Spencer Brown plays so god awful in pass protection that all of a sudden you see Brandon Shell inserted into the first team. But I don't think you're going to see any kind of like early rotation between the two, especially early on in training camp. I really do think the Buffalo Bills are going to give Spencer Brown the first crack at right tackle. Dave, I'm not sure how much of that you heard, but I'm I'm not buying a competition between Spencer yeah. Brown and Brandon Shell. I think Spencer Brown is is going to be the dude unless he really just lays an egg and they have to insert Brandon Shell. Yeah, no, I heard all of it pretty much. Uh I think that uh I think you're right. And I think that okay, the Bill signed Brandon Shell graded out pretty well as a run blocker last year. Spencer Brown appears to be healthy coming into this camp. I mean, he was healthy by all accounts going into the last camp and then had that mm-hmm. injury in camp that really just, I think honestly messed up his entire season to be perfectly fair. I mean, like just never really had it. He had flashes, obviously Eric and Anthony have done a great job kind of Mm -hmm. showing how athletic he can be in the running game, especially pulling from right to left and clearing paths and some of those wide zone runs. But um, the fact that the bills didn't really make any serious investment at that position um, in the off season really tells me, all I need to know about how they feel about Spencer Brown. They really probably do feel like he is the guy. Yes. They brought back David Questenberry. Yes. They signed Brandon shell. That's more of insurance than anything. Um, veterans who have been in the league, they're not guys that you're expecting mm-hmm. to be the long-term answer. You are still expecting if you're Brandon Bean at this point to be Spencer Brown, to be the long-term answer the conversation heading up into the draft was like, what tackle could we possibly get? Could we get a Dewan Jones? Could we get a, um, you know, could we get a Darnell Wright? Like those were the conversations we were having. One we and, could have. One we know we had no chance. <laughs> and, and and like the I, the focus, like yes, we did talk about guards, right? We did talk about mm-hmm. Osiris Torrance. We know he was on a top thirty with the with the Bills. We talked guards, but I would say like seventy percent of the conversation was more about like the tackle that the bills could get at that pick or in the second round. And so the fact that they didn't address it in the draft either and went interior shows me Mm -hmm. that the bills really do uh, are pushing their chips into the middle of the table with Spencer Brown. This is a really big year for Spencer Brown to prove whether he really should be in the future plans for the bills beyond his rookie contract, which I know goes into 2024. So it's not like this is it for him, Mm -hmm. right? He still has another year after this, but like, this to me is a an ascension year for him if he can make it happen, like really show the Bills that, hey, I'm going to have a good year in 2023. And by the way, you're going to get another really valuable year out of me on my rookie contract in 2024 before I potentially get a new contract. And, and that would be a nice problem mm-hmm. for the Bills to have is if Spencer Brown really could pave that um, path for himself and prove to the Bills that, hey, this is – resources we don't have to allocate <laughs> into the 2024 mm-hmm. off season, right? Like that would be yeah. nice. So just zip canoe coming with a great response. He said, we really didn't know Brown was ready to go last year until days before the season started. I think inherited his growth, not having all off season last year. Couldn't agree more just to go back to Osiris Torrance real quick. Carl Toman coming in with a super chat. I always appreciate you, Carl. He says, Osiris needs to play so well. He can't be denied. And that's, that's right. But the question is going to be, and I sort of hinted at this is like, is he going to get the chance? Like, is he going to get first team reps? So he's got to, when he, when he gets in there with the backups, he's got to dominate the backups and he's got to really prove that he deserves a chance with those starters. And then when he gets in there, 
as you said, he can't be denied. And RJ Melvo comes in and says, it would be nice if we finally hit on one of these old linemen. If Torrance can be a legit top, legit top 15 starter, this old line could do some special things. And I agree. I, he's got a sturdy, powerful base. I think something that a lot of the offensive linemen on this football team lack. And I think against some of the interior defenders that we're going to have to face over the course of this season and many seasons to come, having a people mover like Osiris Torrance, having a guy with a powerful base and pass protection could really help the rest of this offensive line do some quality things. And that leads us to sort of the last thing to look for at training camp. There's a lot of other dudes. Like I, the, the, the top six guys are really set in stone with Dawkins, McGovern, Morris, Bates, Brown, and Torrance. I think some people would argue Brandon Shell is number seven. Some people have him ahead of David Questenberry. Other people think he's in competition with David Questenberry. But you look around. Veteran David Questenberry, veteran Brandon Shell versus a younger guy in Tommy Doyle working his way back from injury. You have Richard Garage from Florida, the UDFA with some upside. In the middle of that d- offensive line, you have David Edwards and Ike Butker and Greg Manx, veterans, versus some younger guys in Alec Anderson, Kevin Jarvis, and Nick Broker, our seventh round draft pick. A lot of versatile pieces, a lot of competition in the back half of that depth chart to keep an eye out for. The Buffalo Bills, I don't want to say an embarrassment of riches, but I think there's an embarrassment of depth here, really. The Buffalo Bills have some really quality depth along this offensive line and some really interesting pieces. Is there anyone in particular that you got your eye on in the back half of the depth chart? Well, I'll say this. I think they have a very good depth and and almost maybe an embarrassment of riches on the interior. I wouldn't Mm -hmm. say that's the case for the, for the tackle positions. Right. I I think that Nick broker, obviously I was, I was a big fan of his coming out. We cut that clip of him that I mentioned him in the pre-draft process before when we drafted him and he's played tackle and guard. He's a technician. He's got good hands, like, but he's not, he's not probably going to be a guy that like moves the needle much or like does a ton to give you confidence that he's going to necessarily play tackle uh, right away. So like for me, like I I am still concerned about tackle, right? I I like Tommy Doyle. We know he's athletic, but like he's kind of becoming almost like the Tommy Sweeney of the tackles Mm -hmm. to me where like he's been more talked about of have, of having like potential than he's really done improving that he could be a real good tackle in the NFL. And I know injuries have kind of cut into that um, evaluation some, but like at some point, like he's got to show something more than I think just being like that extra offensive lineman on the field at Mm -hmm. times. Now, maybe that's his role. That's fine. But like, it still gives me a lot of hesitation knowing that beyond Dion behind Dion Dawkins, there is still a ton of uncertainty, no matter how much confidence the bills might have and Spencer Brown going in this year, Mm -hmm. that to me is what's going to lean me one way or the other. If Spencer Brown really shows up this year in camp and and starts showing up in the season, I think that I will start to feel a lot more comfortable about how this season progresses in in towards, towards the playoffs, because that to me still scares me a lot. To me, the sleeper on the back half uh, of the depth chart is, is Alec Anderson last year's UDFA out of UCLA. I think Aaron Cromer really likes Alec Anderson. He's now had a year on the practice squad. It's going to be really interesting to see where Alec Anderson lines up because he's got that inside-outside versatility. He can play guard. He can play tackle. My guess is you'll probably see him mixing in at right guard, and you'll see him mixing in at right tackle. I wouldn't be surprised if Alec Anderson knocks some guys off this roster. If he beats out a Tommy Doyle, if he forces the Buffalo Bills' hand and they trade like a David Edwards and go get a six-round pick for David Edwards, and roll with a guy like Alec Anderson instead of maybe the sure thing veteran. It really wouldn't shock me if Alex Anderson is the guy who rises to the top, but he's got some competition. Kevin Jarvis, Nick Broker, who you mentioned. So it's going to be really interesting to see Richard Garage from Florida. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to see who, who rises to the top in training camp and in the preseason. And if these guys can have a good preseason and they can keep Matt Barkley and Kyle Allen standing up straight, there's some really good skill position wide receiver depth on this football team too. Some exciting young guys. Um, so we, who knows? Maybe we can have the greatest show on turf in the preseason. Actually, 
have some watchable <laughs> football games. <laughs> All right. To, to, to close out the show here this evening, obviously we have the giveaway of the August 3rd training camp tickets, which we're going to get to in a moment. But before we do last week, we sort of ranked the, the storylines and, and this week I want to give, I, I want you to give me one. And for anyone in the, the comment section, give me the, the number one storyline that you have heading into training camp for the Buffalo bills offense this season. And if you're listening on demand, head on over into the comment section and leave a comment as well. And we will, uh, over the course of the week, get into the comment section and we will, we, we will respond to you guys with what your storyline is. To me, it's the way that Ken Dorsey utilizes all of these weapons, whether it's getting Stefan Diggs the ball more, peppering Stefan Diggs, whether it's moving guys around, making them more versatile chess pieces, getting Gabriel Davis in the slot more, utilizing Dalton Kincaid, utilizing Damian Harris, utilizing Latavius Murray. How is James Cook used? Like on and on and on. We can t- talk about and have this conversation. What personnel packages I can be using. So to me, the number one story of training camp is going to be t- Ken Dorsey and what he does with this plethora of weapons that Brandon Bean has supplied him over the course of the off season. What is your number one storyline? I mean, that is the number one storyline, right? Cause it mm-hmm. permeates through the entire offense, um, every position group, right? It, it matters how Ken Dorsey handles this offense and what he's going to do now in his second mm-hmm. year as a coordinator. I think underlying that you can look at some of those other storylines you mentioned, but um, that has to be above and beyond the major theme of camp this year on offense is what is Ken Dorsey doing to one improve upon his, you know, play calling ability and other, you know, schematics going into year two for himself to how he in- implements some of these newer pieces that we mentioned in the show description, guys like Deontay Hardy, guys like Damian Harris. So it's not just about the receivers and Dalton Kincaid and, De- and Deontay Hardy, but also the backs and Harris and Murray, not to mention James Cook now having the mantle as the lead back. Like it, this is, this is all coming on to Ken Dorsey because in a time where in the early stages of Josh Allen's ascension, the pressure continued to be on Josh Allen to mm-hmm. show that what he did was sustainable, right? And that it, he wasn't a one-year wonder in that he didn't have just a fluke season that we're past that now, right? Josh Allen is of the elite. He is now going to have probably his fifth really solid season in a row. Um, and that is, kind of shifted the pressure right off of Mm -hmm. Josh Allen and more to the coordinators, whether it was Brian Dayball and now Ken Dorsey. So I'm with you. I think that's the number one storyline. And then maybe number two, as an honorable mention is the gelling and the, in the makeup of the offensive line. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's been a big question, obviously heading into the draft, what the bills were going to do to address and protect Josh Allen. We saw the investments they made at the interior of the offensive line and signing guys like David, David Edwards and drafting Osiris Torrance. Spencer Brown still has a lot to prove. So um, that to me would be my honorable mention, the offensive line as sort of a, a, you know, underbelly of the Ken Dorsey, uh, you know, theme there. Yeah. 100% Carl Toman coming in saying the number one storyline coming into camp is everyone will be glued to Stefan Diggs's first press conference. Everyone wants to know that Josh Allen and Stefan are brothers in arms and we all want to hear Stefan speak. Yeah. I, I'm not going to lie. I want, I want to hear Stefan speak. It'll be day one uh, and that'll be it. I feel like <laughs> hopefully. Do you think they're going to throw Stefan to the wolves day one? Or do you think no. they're going to make the beat reporters earn it? Make him make him uh, wait a couple of days. Get a couple I don't of know. Alan I, Diggs I, I, handshakes in there. Get a couple of highlight reel touchdowns before they, they trot him out in front of, in, in front of the Hornets nest. Yeah. Maybe, maybe do it right after he has like a really good practice and, yeah. like, and then it's like all <laughs> like high fives and rainbows. It's like, I don't know, man, but I don't know. I hope it's just one of those things. Like he's going to get asked about it. Just let's move on after yeah. that. Like, it's just, it's going to be more annoying than anything. Pops mafia comes in and says how the offensive line comes together. Sort of, as you said there as well. So that should be interesting, super interesting. And And speaking of pops mafia, before we head out here this evening, Pops Mafia is super generous. He had two extra tickets to training camp, general admission for the August 3rd practice. And what we did was 
anyone who commented on our show last week after the show aired live, people who commented in the comment section below, we got we put you guys in the running. We uh, randomly put all the names into a generator and, and, and popped out a name. And that person we're going to be revealing in a moment. And that person is going to win those two tickets to training camp. The tickets are through Ticketmaster. Uh, if you uh, want to get the tickets, you're going to have to hit up Dave on Twitter at Tilt Money because he's the one handling the, the, the Ticketmaster. Me and Ticketmaster do not get along. I still think I have some tickets to some sporting events just sitting in there that I, I never even got to utilize because I could never find them. So we're going to do that right now. Um, thank you, Pops Mafia, for offering those up. Thank you to all those who commented. Seriously, like if you're listening live or if you're watching later on demand, if you want to support the show, one of the number one things you can do is just leave a comment after the show is over, whether it's a question, whether it's a topic, whether it's answering sort of the question of the day, the day that we do on the podcast, it helps boost us in the algorithm uh, and, and helps get us in front of some more eyeballs. So we really would appreciate if you guys could maybe take 30 seconds to a minute after every show to smash the like and to, to leave a comment. But if you don't have that time, we always appreciate you in the live feed as well. But uh, Dave, do you want to reveal our winner this evening? Yeah, and again, thanks again to Pops for supplying those tickets. The winner of the training camp tickets giveaway for August 3rd is none other than RJ Melville, uh, who comment, commented on the show uh, last week in the comment section um, on the show, after the show on the show page. RJ also in here uh, most nights with us commenting early and often as well. I saw him in here earlier. I'm not sure if he's still in here or not, but um, yeah. RJ, if you are still in here, you won the tickets and um, you'll need to DM me on Twitter. Um, yeah. We, we might info. be able to just DM him because I think he's yeah. pretty active on Twitter. So we'll, we'll, or I'll DM <laughs> you. That's fine. Uh, oh. Just find you up. Oh, there oh, he yeah. is. <laughs> there you go. So RJ, you won the tickets. Um, I can DM you or you can DM me on Twitter and we'll get that sorted out for you. It's just a matter of trans transferring them over to you through your phone number. So congratulations on that. Hope you uh, enjoy going to Bill's practice courtesy of Pops Mafia, of course. Thank yeah. you, Pops. All right. So ladies and gents, the last predictive show of the off season, everything from here on out is going to be reactions. We're going to be reacting to things that we actually see live on the football field so dave any final thoughts before we head out of here this evening well what i like actually it, it's going to be a little bit of fomo right because we're obviously not going to be there with the guys um yeah. live for these first couple practices and we're going to have a lot of things we want to react to and we're going to react on social media that's obvious but um we're going to have almost like a week of practices under our belt before we get back on the air again so i'm looking forward to kind of like maybe avoiding the initial knee jerk like we have every first day of practice <laughs> and waiting till a few practices in and then really collecting myself for next Monday. So I I'm excited to, uh, to react for that. Yeah. And, and for those of you who are already cover one, one past subscribers, thank you so much. And it's that time of year to sort of re up. There's going to be a new t-shirt this year and some other new additions to the cover one club access one pass. And if you're not a member of the cover one community, Head on over to cover one dot football and sign up for one pass club access. You get a sweet t-shirt. You get a sweet decal that you can stick onto your Yeti. You get exclusive members only content, in-depth analysis from the guys, access on unlimited devices, access to us in the cover one community and the cover one contributors through our private Slack channel, all for just $57 a year. Again, if you're interested in the cover one, one pass, which is another way to support us here at cover one, you can make your play for $57 a year at cover1.football. All right. Thank you guys so much. Seriously, this is just me and Dave talking for maybe 35 minutes, 40 minutes into a microphone. If it wasn't for you guys in the comment section, you guys are the reason we always end up going hour 15, hour 30 every night. But we love it because we love having this back and forth conversation. The feedback that you guys add to every single show makes us better fans. Hopefully, we make you guys better fans as well. And it's finally here, Dave. 
training camp is finally here. Plus, we're going to try to add a few uh, since we did, we got copyrighted last year when we start doing our pregame <laughs> pre uh, shows this year. We've got some, yeah. some new graphics to use. Yeah, we'll be, uh... should, should, I, should, I tease, should I tease some uh, <laughs> some of these graphics here at the yeah. end? Yeah, there yeah, we go. We got some. Oh, here we go. There we go. There we go. There's the take. That's, the, hires. that's uh, the one. That's, that's the, the one. one. So we won't bring you. We won't be able to bring you the audio anymore. Thanks to uh, Scott Strap. He, it, it, he, he was solely responsible. It he, was the Creed song. So yeah, he slid into our DMs and told us to uh, C and D <laughs> on that, or we were going to be Dude, in trouble. The so. number of cease and desist that we've gotten uh, over the years is pretty incredible. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, from the bad boys of Bills Mafia with all our C and D's to you all. Until next time, go Bills. Go Bills. Thank you for watching tonight's episode of the Air Raid Hour. Make sure to hit that like button on the way out. If you are catching the show on demand, leave a reply in the comment section and we will respond over the course of the week. You can always listen to every episode next day on all major podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify by searching Air Raid Buffalo. Thank you for your continued support, and as always, Go Bills! <laughs>